Right. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the after lunch session. I know this is uh, somehow difficult actually to concentrate, especially uh, after a heavy meal. But I believe that the topic that we are having for discussion is interesting enough in order to, uh, to wake us up, yeah? So we are going to talk, we'll be, we'll be talking about uh, sectarianism and international relations. And some people actually believe that there is no best place to examine the relationship between sectarianism and interstate relation better than the Middle East. I believe Simon will be telling us a little bit about, about this, about the level of analysis, about the manipulation of sectarianism in geopolitical context. Uh, I will be leaving the floor for Simon, and then we'll go back for, for discussion and comments, questions, and likewise. Okay. Thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, I will start with a very quick apology. Uh, if at any point you see me checking my phone, I, I really am not trying to be rude. My wife is currently in hospital, so I'm just trying to make sure that everything is okay. So please, um, please excuse me if you see me just checking. So, inshallah, all is okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to do a round table, a round table of one, which could be interesting. Uh, but what I thought I would do is sort of build on some of the stuff that Nader and I have been working on from slightly different angles, uh, the sectarianization aspects, the securitization aspect, and then possibly the, the de-sectarianization stuff. And I don't want to tread too much in, in the, into the content of what I'll talk about tomorrow, but I thought that we've spent a lot of time talking about domestic forces. So I think it's, it's really important that we, we contextualize each of these individual cases within both a regional and an international context. So I was, I've been talking a bit about space in, uh, in my discussant points and my general comments to people. And I think space is, is a really important force in terms of what it is that we're doing, be it identity politics, sectarianism, international relations, yet it's all too often ignored. And I'll, I'll just briefly introduce one of the, the key scholars on space that, that I found particularly useful, who is Doreen Massey. She's a, um, a geographer by trade, but has written extensively on spatial ideas. And, and she's particularly concerned about how how issues interact at particular times and particular places, but that it's not just the interaction of the, the actors in a particular spot, but she says that there's a, a whole melange of issues that come together when, um, when we look at particular arenas or spaces or places. Now, Massey is trying to respond to a very fixed idea of space, the idea that we can take a snapshot of something and that it is fixed and that it is, um, is static. And what she does is she presents a, a, a picture of space that is combined of three different premises. One, that space is constantly in flux, that it's moving, that it's fluid. Second, that it's a site of heterogeneity, okay? That we're not just dealing with one possible outcome or one possible issue or identity, but we're dealing with a myriad possibilities. And that's a consequence of the interactions of all of those agents, structures, forces that are in particular areas. And then the third is that space is shaped through the interaction of those within a particular space, a particular area. And she has this wonderful turn of phrase that says that space is a product of the interaction of the homogenous and the intimately tiny. Okay? I think that's a really interesting way of putting it. And I'll, I'll just try and, and put it in the context of this room. So, for example, this spatial arena is shaped by the interaction of everything and everyone that is in this room. 
in terms of what we had for lunch, whether we had too much, whether we didn't have enough, whether we've over-caffeinated, whether we've under-caffeinated, whether we've hydrated enough, so the, mi the micro forces. But it's also shaped by the geopolitical current, shaped by globalization, the fact that Qatar is able to bring everyone here today economically. It's shaped by geopolitical forces in the sense that um, Saudis are not able to be present at this particular meeting, okay? So Massey says that in order to understand space, we need to bring all these different things together. And I think this is where um, international relations has a lot to say. Now, I should say that IR hasn't done a particularly good job of engaging with space in terms of theorizing, and that geographers have done a much better job of theorizing spatial factors, spatial forces than IR scholars. So that's something to bear in mind. But I think that when we're looking at IR, we need to look at space. We need to look at the interaction of all of these forces. And that's particularly true in the case of, of sects, of states, and of, um, of everything that happens in between, okay? So I wanted to start my, my opening roundtable remarks with just with that little preface. And we'll do the same thing as we did the other day, of me sharing some remarks about things, and then we'll get you in pairs addressing a couple of questions. And then I'd like to open it up to more of a discussion amongst yourselves in terms of how some of these forces shape your particular cases, be it India, be it Nigeria, be it Bahrain, okay? Because I think we've got a lot to learn from each other. So that's, that's my plan for the session, okay? And I think what I'll do is I will, I will break it into, into three parts. The first is a, a bit of a, a genealogy of, of key dates in the international relations of the Middle East. The second is a bit of a reflection on Nader Hashemi and Danny Pastel's sectarianization thesis. But I'll, I'll tease out some of the securitization aspect that I think underpin what Hashemi and Pastel are doing. And then we'll reflect on audiences. And audiences are a key feature of space, a key feature of sectarianism, and a key feature of, of what we're doing here. So if we look at the international relations of what it is that, that we're concerned with, the rise of sex-based politics, um, the, the primordialists will reduce what we're doing to the Battle of Karbala, which we're going to put to one side because that's not particularly of interest to us right now. But I think there are, there are typically three dates that are seen to be of, of note in terms of the burgeoning sect-based tensions that we're seeing across the Islamic world. So those dates are what, chronologically? What's the first date? Any ideas? Maybe the fall of the Ottoman Empire in 1920-ish? No, I'm talking more modern. Yeah. Right at the end, shout a date out. Oh, yeah. One of them is the, um, the incident of uh, Kemal, when for the first time uh, Ali and his supporters and the people who were opposing him. No, I'm talking modern, modern, modern history, period. recent past. Oh, 1979, thank you, yes. 1979, but oh. for a number of reasons, okay? 1979 is obviously um, the fall of the Shah, the establishment of the Islamic Republic, and that, that caused ripples across both the Islamic world and also um, the Middle East. Now, scholars working on the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which is central to this, this particular year, they tend to look at, at this rivalry from three main approaches. One suggests that it's all about religion, stupid. It's a Sunni state and it's a Shia state. And if you look at the rhetoric that quickly emerged between, um, between Ayatollah Khomeini and the Saudis, it's easy to see why in some respects. But Khomeini was very careful in his language to stress the collective um, nature of, of Islam and the Islamic Republic. He wanted to stress that it was an Islamic Republic, not a Shia Republic. Conversely, the Saudis wanted to stress that it was Shia and Persian, thus to reducing its appeal 
across the Islamic world. But the same year, there are two other events that are of note. The first is the seizure of the Grand Mosque in Saudi Arabia, which really sort of politicized Sunni Islam and, and had a dramatic impact on the reawakening or the empowerment or emboldenment, however you want to call it, of, of Sunni fundamentalist groups. And the other event is the, um, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which started to create this, or facilitate this flow of individuals to fight in a, in a conflict that pitted a colonial aggressor against local forces. Okay, so that's one event. And then over the, the coming decades, you start to see the ebbs and the flows in the rivalry between the Saudis and the Iranians. It's not a static relationship. It's not a static rivalry. So very quickly, you start to see this vitriolic rivalry emerging. But that, that starts to uh, diminish with the death of Khomeini and the opening up of the Iranian political system. You start to see figures like um, Rafsanjani coming to the fore and a struggle for political influence in Iran kind of helped create these conditions for a possible rapprochement. There was a thawing in relations, and there was a, a, a serious earthquake in, in Iran that the Saudis sent a, a good amount of aid to the state for. And that created this, this burgeoning rapprochement. And that, that is interesting in that it thaws out relations. So the second approach that some people say is that it's not about religion. It's about geopolitics, stupid. It's about regional influence. And they would say, look, if you look at what's happening here, these two states, they continue to be Sunni, ostensibly Sunni and Shia. But their, their um, relations, this rivalry has shifted, it's evolved. So it's not about religion, it can't be. It's about geopolitics. It's about power. And then the third, of course, is a bit of a combination of the two. They say it's the instrumentalization of religious difference that serves as a source of legitimacy for whoever is, is proposing particular things. And that's the approach that I tend to take. And I think it's, it's an interesting one and, and quite an important one because it speaks to what it is that we're looking at today, this idea that religion is often instrumentalized and it's used to denote legitimacy and secure legitimacy amongst a range of groups. Okay? So although the Iranians try to speak to a broad audience, the Saudis are very keen to stress that this isn't about Islam per se, that it's about Shia Islam and a heavily Persianized vision of Shia Islam, thus reducing their appeal more broadly. Okay, so the second event that we're dealing with is 2003, the US-led invasion of Iraq, which created new spaces for the, the rivalry between these two states to emerge. It opens up new spaces for, um, for the Saudis and the, the Iranians to begin to try and shape the region in their image which supports this idea that it's about geopolitics, that the Iranians start to put a great deal of money into Iraq. They start funding militias, exiled Iraqi officials that had fled to Iran during Saddam Hussein's time, return to Iraq, and by virtue of that, the Iranians gain a great deal of influence. This worries the Saudis dramatically, that there is a, an Iranian um, client state, if you will, on their northern border. And so they start to try and fund various tribal groups. They start to get more and more involved in Iraqi politics. And they urge the United States to, quote unquote, cut off the head of the snake. Okay, they're, they're very conscious at this point that they want, to, um, they want to get the United States to, to strike against Iran, to prevent Iran from, from um, becoming more and more emboldened across the region. Okay, so this is about power and influence here, right? It's about the, the Saudis trying to bandwagon with the United States, trying to exert influence. And we start to see the smaller Gulf states, for example, falling in line here, equally concerned about Iranian aspirations and about the capacity of Iran to speak to, um, to, to local Shia populations. Now, over the past few days, we've talked about these long-standing fears dating back to the formation of the Iraqi state, for example, and the Bahraini state, the sense that, that Shia groups can be manipulated by, uh, by Persia or by Iran. 
And of course, there are particular incidents that, that I'm sure we're all familiar with that support this hypothesis. But the, the Saudis are very clear that they want the US to strike against Iran. And it's at this point that, that we perhaps start to see a thawing in relations between the Saudis, and particularly the Bahrainis, and the Israelis. Again, you start to see this, this sense of, of bandwagoning in an attempt to balance power. So you have Iran, which is a particular threat, not only to the Saudis and to other states in the Gulf, but to Israel. And so when you have, according to traditional IR, you have a threat, and you have a state that was, was traditionally a threat, but less as one now, then IR theory says you work together to counter the threat of this other state. Okay? And then the third date that we have is 2011, and, and all of what we've been seeing becomes more and more important, more and more visceral. These fears about the manipulation of domestic politics becomes more prominent amongst states across the region. And of course, the events of, of Bahrain in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings are, I guess, perhaps the quintessential example of this, whereby the Al-Khalifa begin a process of what Hashim and Pastel call sectarianization, the framing of particular groups along sect-based lines in pursuit of their, um, their own survival. And I should say that, that Toby, who I think is hiding down at the bottom of the room, has written about this in a wonderful chapter in Hashim and Pastel's book, um, documenting the, the processes of this sectarianization in Bahrain. And I think Toby's chapter is really interesting in the sense that he demonstrates how there are these long-standing frustrations, socioeconomic frustrations, a range of different issues that, that had pervaded Bahraini politics since, well, across the 20th century and into the 21st century that aren't sectarian, but that sects and sect-based identities have been used have been manipulated by those in power in an attempt to ensure their survival. So that is, broadly speaking, um, what Hashimi and Pastel talk about in their sectarianization thesis. The idea that sects and sectarian identities have been manipulated in pursuit of regime power and survival. But I think what we're seeing here is, is not so much about um, sectarianization, it's securitization. The idea that uh, this is a, another of the approaches that we're, we can use to understand sectarianism. But it's about the, it's, it's a, a Copenhagen school approach to understanding security. And I think it offers a far more nuanced reading of how sectarianization takes place through the linguistic framing of particular groups as an existential threat to survival. And this is, is clearly the case in, in Bahrain, okay? The idea that, um, that Shia groups are seen to present an existential threat to the, um, to the state of Bahrain, to the Al-Khalifa kingdom, okay? But if you look at what was happening on the streets, in early 2011, you have large groups of people who are saying not Sunni, not Shia, just Bahraini. So this was why the, the protest was seen as such a serious challenge to the state, in the sense that this was a widespread popular movement that wasn't defined by sect, but was defined by common grievances. And so the way of trying to ensure their survival was through framing, uh, through creating divisions amongst the protest groups framing one group as a particular threat, as an existential threat. And this is done through using language, picking up on particular terms, using language as a way of presenting groups as a threat. Okay? It's not just the Bahrainis that, that this took place in. The, um, the Saudis were very keen to stress that Iran posed an existential threat to regional security. Okay? The Iranians have done the same thing. The securitization of particular groups and particular issues is a common feature of, of regional politics, of Middle Eastern politics, of global politics. And the Copenhagen School has, has looked at the application of this approach in, in myriad different cases. And I'm sure that we've all got our own examples of how this type of approach 
plays out. So I think that that thesis of, of sectarianization and securitization is really quite important. But what it also does is that it creates complex ideas of audience and it, it opens up questions about intentionality. So this idea of framing Shia groups as an existential threat, of course. Uh, using this as an example, you can't just talk about Bahraini Shia groups as an existential threat because there are shared values, shared identities that are derived from religion. Okay? Of course there are complexities at play. Of course there are localized, um, malleable, fluid identities that are a consequence of, of time, place, and space. But in the lazy framing of, of Group X as an existential threat to a particular state, then you start to, to get ideas and grievances that transcend that particular case. And I think this, this is increasingly felt in the, uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings when you have Shia groups that are being framed as a threat in Bahrain with the implication that Shia groups are all doing the bidding of Iran, okay? This idea that Shia groups are, by extension, an Iranian proxy that are fifth columnists that don't have the, uh, their own agency. So the point that I'm making here is that if, given the shared religious normative environment that, that the Middle East is, is in part shaped by, if you were to use this type of sectarianization or securitization approach, then there are going to be unintended consequences. So if you're wanting to frame a particular group as a threat, there are potentially going to be other repercussions beyond that particular instance of a, uh, of a speech act. Okay, and we can all use, we can all draw upon different examples from our own cases for this. And the, the point that I'm wanting to get at here is that when we're looking at sects and sectarianism, we're dealing with a complex set of relations about levels of analysis. We're dealing with the very localized micro aspects that Sara was talking about before lunch. But then we're also dealing with the broader geopolitical features that Prem was talking about before lunch. And what I want to, to get us to do in this session is to reflect on how we move between those different levels. What are some of the challenges involved and how and, and why particular levels of analysis are of interest and importance, okay? So we have about an hour, and I have three questions that I'd like us to discuss, but I'd also like to do it slightly differently from last time in that I would like us all to discuss the same question at first, in pairs, and then we'll work our way through, okay? So what I'd like you to do is uh, I would like you to organize yourselves into pairs, starting at this end. Yes, sir? If you're going to take a round of the feedback, yeah. would it make sense having four persons in each group then? Sure, why not? Okay, four people per room. Starting at this end, you can organize yourselves, I'm sure. And the first question that I would like you to do is to reflect on how important you think regional forces are in processes of or the cultivation of sect-based difference, okay? So I want you to reflect on your own cases, and when you report back, I want you just to select one case, and then report back reflecting on the question. So how important regional factors are, okay? How important are regional factors in shaping these examples of sect-based difference? Okay, so I'll give you 10 minutes, and then after that we will coalesce and you can share your, um, your initial reflections. Thank you.